Please take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to the book of Exodus, Exodus and chapter 12. We've just sung of God's chastening hand of our foolishness, but God is also a God of salvation. And we read here of His great work of salvation in the Old Testament, the Passover, and how the people of God were to celebrate that uh, through the slaying of a lamb, through the putting of blood around the doorpost, and the preparing and eating of unleavened bread. Let's give our attention now to God's holy word in Exodus chapter 12. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, he shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You, shall, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now, you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight, and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night roasted in fire with unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in the fire." its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire, and thus you shall eat it, with a belt on your waist, with your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial. And you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation. And on the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation for you. No manner of work shall be done on them, but that which everyone must eat, that only may be prepared by you. So you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for on this same day I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread, until the 21st day of the month at evening. For seven days no leaven shall be found in your houses, since whoever eats what is leavened, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a stranger or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened in all your dwellings. You shall eat unleavened bread. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word. Please take your Psalters again and turn with me to Psalm number 38 again, and you can find that again on page 48, and we're singing verses 15 to 22.
if you have a Bible, please turn with me this time to 1 Corinthians and to chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll be reading the first eight verses and considering them together. But as you turn there, I would like to remind you that the theme of all of 1 Corinthians is living for and through Christ in this present age. And we live undoubtedly, don't we, in an immoral age. Divorce, inappropriate intimacy before or outside of marriage is common. Uh, the viewing of sexual images or videos, homosexuality, transgenderism, disrespect for authority, dishonesty, they're all right all around us. And this immorality fills the entertainment around us. It shapes the clothing that is on offer. It um, has even filtered into our school curriculums. And we see its effects on our screens, in the relationships that we have with people, and in public affairs and private affairs. It's pervasive throughout our society. And so it was in Corinth. Now, one of the major challenges to the Corinthians, as they were trying to live in and for Christ, was this immorality. And 1 Corinthians is, in fact, a series of five tensions between uh, the way of Christ and the way of the world. So far, we have been looking at uh, divisions and the worldly way of dividing and how that has changed in Christ. And now, Paul is pivoting to this focus on immorality and uh, relationships. How do we live for Christ in an immoral age, both individually and corporately? It's a pressing question for us, is it not? Well, that's what we're going to be looking at over the next uh, several weeks in 1 Corinthians as we consider chapters 5 to 7. But now we're going to begin that um, by looking at 5, 1 to 8, and Paul begins this discussion by exhorting the Corinthians to take sin seriously. Listen as I read God's Word. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It is actually reported um, that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For indeed, as absent in the body but present in spirit, I have already judged as though I were present him who has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you were gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, Purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth." Thus ends the reading of God's holy word. So, in this passage, we have this particularly scandalous instance of immorality being tolerated or overlooked in the Corinthian congregation. 
a man was in a sexual relationship with his father's wife, uh, probably a stepmother, um, probably this woman was much closer to his own age. Um, we don't know the exact details, but that's what the commentators think, and it makes sense. Um, nonetheless, it was something that was just absolutely beyond the pale for the society of that time, and indeed um, in relation to the Old Testament laws. And the Corinthians seemed to be doing very little, if anything, about it. So in response, call, Paul is calling the Corinthians to take sin seriously. He's calling them to take sin seriously with mourning, uh, by implementing church discipline, and for the purpose of holiness. But it's not just a legalistic command. It's rooted in what Christ has done and our consequent obligation to live in and through him. As the passage says, for indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us, therefore let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. One way we live in and through Christ in this present age is by taking sin seriously. And so my title this morning is simply Take Sin Seriously. And, and my points are mourn, exercise church discipline, and pursue holiness. Mourn, exercise church discipline, and pursue holiness. As I've said already, Paul begins this passage astonished at their attitude. This is something that they should recognize as wrong, and yet they're glorying. They're puffed up. They ought to be mourning, but they're not. He says in verse 6, your glorying is not good. The message for us is that sin, particularly serious and scandalous sin, calls for mourning. It calls for mourning because it's against God, because it brings the church and Christ into disrepute, and because it brings the judgment of God upon his people, or the fatherly chastisement of God upon his people. Think back to when the children of Israel were going into the land of um, Canaan. You remember that they went and they destroyed the city of Jericho, and they weren't supposed to take anything in that city. But there was a man there who took some things, and then the next city they went on to, they were defeated. And it came out that this man had disobeyed God. And, and the reason why Israel was defeated in the next place was because there was sin in the camp. Contrast Joshua, the leader of God's people, with the Corinthians. Uh, listen here to Joshua's response. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell on the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of Israel and they put dust on their heads. And he says, For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth. Then what will you do, he's speaking to the Lord, for your name? Joshua is overcome with sorrow, so much so that he spends the rest of the day in mourning before the Lord. And one of the things he is most concerned about is the honor and glory of God. Likewise, contrast the Corinthians' response to uh, Ezra. At the end of the book of Ezra, it comes out that God's people have not kept themselves holy uh, by marrying uh, foreign wives and, and pagan wives. Look at Ezra's response. So, when I heard this thing, I tore my garment and my robe and plucked out some of the hair of my head and beard and sat down astonished. Then everyone who trembled at the words of the Lord of Israel assembled to me because of the transgression of those who had been carried away captive. And I sat 
astonished until the evening sacrifice. At the evening sacrifice, I arose from my fasting, and having torn my garment and my rose robe, I fell on my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God. And he begins his prayer like this. O oh my God, I am too ashamed and humiliated to lift up my face to you, my God, for our iniquities have risen higher than our heads and our guilt has grown up to the heavens. We could multiply examples throughout Scripture. This is how godly men respond to sin in God's people. The Corinthians weren't doing that. Now, think about the immorality that is rife in the professing church in our land. There are professing church leaders who are rubber stamping things that are blatantly against God's law, like homosexuality. There are others who would say that's completely against God's law, but they'll ignore the, the person living an immoral lifestyle in their congregation or they'll fail to pastor them well, or fail to challenge them to change their lifestyle. There is immorality all around us in the culture, and that immorality has seeped into the church, and by and large, the church has turned a blind eye to it. And I think we need to learn something from our forefathers in Scripture we could extend that into church history. We need to take warning from what Paul says to the Corinthians here. We need to see the godly response to sin and immorality in God's people, and that is mourning. You might say, well, that's not what our church is like. That's not what I'm like. It's interesting, isn't it? Joshua didn't take the stuff from Jericho. Ezra hadn't took in, or taken foreign wives, but they mourned because they were a part of God's people. They were a part of the corporate whole of God's people, and they recognized that when a part of God's people is unfaithful, it affects the whole, and therefore they mourned. And so we as God's people in this country, can't just distance ourselves and say, we're the faithful few. We don't have anything to do with that. We can be puffed up in our pride. No, we too should look around us at the deplorable state of God's people, and we should mourn. Why don't more people mourn? Why aren't more Christians mourning? I think it's because we have a low view of God. We think of God as our buddy or as our therapist, one who just simply helps us with our problems. We have a low view of the consequences of sin. The society only cares about things when it hurts people as they define it. And the church is beginning just to, to rubber stamp their idea of what sin is. They don't think about what it means to God, and they certainly don't think about God's judgment and the fact that that is the primary consequence of sin. We have a low view of God. We have a, a low view of the consequences of sin. We have a lack of understanding that when we don't live according to God's ways, the way that God has designed things, that the wheels start to come off. And we have a low view of the glory of Christ. Because although the world doesn't buy into our morality, they sure are quick to recognize when we don't buy into our morality. <laughs> and they slander Christ. They say, you know, Christ is nothing because look at his people. And so when we have 
a failure to take sin seriously, when we have a failure to, to mourn over sin in the church, we're really having a low view of the glory of Christ. A low view of the glory of Christ in his people. And so, I think this is a warning to us. We ought to, in our prayer meetings, I ought to more from this pulpit when we pray in, in our pastoral prayers, each of us individually in our private times of prayer, um, fathers and family worship, we ought to be mourning before God for the state of the church and crying out to Him that He would have mercy and to change things. We ought to pray that God would work in us a higher view of Himself, would work in us a more accurate view of the consequences of sin and work in us a higher view of the glory of Christ. We ought to mourn for sin. But Paul doesn't just stop there. He gives them a practical way to address that sin, and that is church discipline. That's my second point. Now, church discipline has fallen on rather hard times today. It's unappreciated in the modern church. It seems harsh and unloving, and in fact, it can be done that way. Uh, but it doesn't need to be done that way. It's something that God has given His church to address sin. And in our passage, what we see is the most extreme um, censure of church discipline, and that's excommunication. Uh, cutting off from God's people and a delivering over to Satan. I'll come back to that last phrase in a moment, but a, a cutting off from God's people and a delivering over to Satan for the purpose of repentance and restoration. That's what a church discipline is supposed to be. But church discipline doesn't always reach the level of excommunication. In fact, a lot of times it doesn't. Uh, in its most broad sense, church discipline is just pastoral care. It's just the elders being involved in the lives of their people and bringing to bear the Word of God on them for their good in um, gentle rebuke and correction as is needed. But then, of course, there is the more formal thing we often think of as church discipline, which is called judicial discipline. And, and that comes about when uh, there's been a wrong, when it's uh, sought to be addressed privately, first between the, the people immediately involved and then with other witnesses, and that has all uh, not gone anywhere. And so it's brought to the elders of the church. And uh, in our uh, church, we have various steps in, in the history of Reformed church government. Um, it begins with an admonition from the elders and then a rebuke. Um, as we see various places, uh, Paul and, and other elders doing in the New Testament. And then um, if that is of no avail and there's a stubbornness on the part of the, the one who's in sin, then there might be a suspension from the Lord's table, a, a taking away of, of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper for a time. And if that is of no avail, then it gets to this point that we see in our passage. Now, you might ask, why does it seem to jump from zero to 60 in this passage? Well, there are times where things are so fragrant, so um, in your face, and the repentance is so non-existent that it does go immediately there. But the point I'm trying to make is church discipline isn't just excommunication. Nonetheless, because we're dealing with church discipline here, uh, there's several things about this passage which teach us something about not only excommunication, but church discipline as a whole. Uh, we see that it's an imposition of a censure. Um, that's what we have in verses 4 and 5. 
uh, where the church is gathered together and the person involved is uh, cut off from the people of God and delivered over to, uh, to Satan. And they're removed from the church and they're laid open to Satan's attacks, uh, attacks of um, reminding them of their guilt and perhaps also attacks on, on their body. Um, we know that, that Job was blameless, but nonetheless, God enabled him to attack the body of, of Job. And here it speaks of delivering over the flesh to the devil. So this is a very serious thing. Um, there's a censure pronounced, and in this case it's excommunication. It's also, church discipline is something that is to be administered by elders. It's interesting, uh, Paul says that they should have done this already, presumably the elders of the Corinthian congregation, but in the end it's, it's he who does it. And although he says the whole congregation is to gather together, he doesn't say they're to make the judgment, he says they're simply to implement it. And we know from the rest of scripture that it is the elders who have authority in the flock. They're the ones who stand before God with responsibility for the flock. Um, and so it is elders who administer this. It's a censure, it's administered by elders, um, and it's to be administered publicly. He says, when you gather together. This is particularly referring to the, the higher levels of censure and things that are public, sins that are public, um, as this was here. But it's, it's not something that is always in every case to be done privately and in a corner. Um, and then it's to be administered in the name of Christ. The elders of a church, of a denomination, don't do this on their own authority. They are simply ministers acting on behalf of Christ. That's what gives it its, its weight. And then the purposes of church discipline are the honor of Christ. Implicit throughout this passage is that, that Christ is being dishonored. That's why he says even the pagans recognize that this is wrong. If you do this church discipline, you are vindicating Christ. That's one of the purposes of church discipline. It's also aimed at the recovery of the one in sin. You notice, even this one who is engaged in such heinous sin, Paul doesn't say, cut him off, deliver him to save him forever. No. What he says is, do this so that he might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, of course, if someone remains unrepentant until their death, uh, they do remain under excommunication. But the goal is always ever in church discipline, the restoration of that brother or sister. And it is for the purifying of the church. And that is what he is saying in terms of looking at the Passover and, and the purging out of the leaven. Uh, he's, he's likening that leaven to sin and, and the purifying of the people of God, just as that leaven was purified from their houses. So the purposes of church discipline are the honor of Christ, the recovery of the sinner, and the purity of the church. And this passage in particular, I think, is a wake-up call to the modern Western church. If immorality is rife amongst us, if sin is rife amongst us, then we need to be doing what Paul is exhorting the Corinthians to do. We need to be engaging in church discipline. Not because we're mean and nasty, but because we care about the honor of Christ. We want his church to be pure. And we want those who are engaged in sin unto their own hurt to be recovered. We shouldn't be shying away from this as hard and as difficult as it is. 
but we should be studying how do we do this biblically. We should be seeking to practice it in reliance upon God's Holy Spirit. And this is a particular exhortation to those of us who are elders, because it is us who administer these things. But it's also important for those of you who are members of the church to hear these things, because you must support these things. If it's something that's just done by the elders without the support of the congregation, it has very little effect. And therefore, it's, it's up to you to, to support the elders in the work of church discipline when it is public. And it's up to you to pray for those who are in sin and those who are under church discipline. One of the most powerful tools for the recovery of someone under church discipline is the prayers of God's people. We um, have some visitors uh, with us from Woodruff Road Presbyterian Church, and uh, their minister, Carl Robbins, um, has made quite a study of church discipline. Um, he's actually spoken to our elders uh, before on this. Um, but the wonderful thing is that they don't only practice it, but they've also seen people recovered. They've seen people brought back. They've had the joy of standing at the church and, and hugging the people who have been received back into membership. And that is what we ought to be praying for. So it's an exhortation to elders, it's an exhortation to all of us to support this and to pray for its work. And it's also an exhortation to all of us members and elders to submit to discipline as and when it applies to us. Now, please God, the, the more um, severe censures will not be applied to anybody in this room in our lifetime. But for all of us, we will need times where we hear rebuke and exhortation from, a, from an elder, whether that be a fellow elder or um, one of our elders. And that broad sense of church discipline is something we all need to be sensitive to that we may not need more uh, severe censures and that we might grow in our likeness to Christ. And indeed, that is the great driver behind all of this. It's the, the holiness of the church of God. And it's to that which we now turn in my first point. The reason why church discipline is so important is because we are called to be holy as God's people. We are set apart from this world as those who are different, and we are different because we are pure like our Heavenly Father is pure. We live according to His ways, and we love the things that He loves, and we hate the things that He hates. And we need this because a lack of church discipline brings this scandal into the church. A lack of holiness brings this scandal into the church that we have heard about. Scandal is, is when there's a wrong and it's an outrageous wrong, just like was the case here. Think about the sad abuse scandals that have rocked areas like the evangelical wing of the Church of England. What was the problem there? It was a lack of holiness. And then we need this emphasis on holiness because sin is contagious. That again is is part of what he's saying when he's speaking about the Passover. He says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. A, a root of bitterness, a root of, of complaining against one another, a root of cutting one another off, a root of speaking even very subtly against one another. All these things can easily spread a lax standards for our lives, these can easily spread. 
Of course, we don't want to be legalistic, but we want to be white hot in our love for Christ. And a little bit of coolness tolerated soon spreads to the whole lump. And therefore, it is important that, that through discipline in its broadest sense, and when necessary in its more judicial sense, we pursue the holiness of God's people so that we avoid the scandal of sin, so that we avoid the contagion of sin and, and its work through the body. But even more importantly, we should take sin seriously as we practice church discipline because Christ died for us and calls us to live in and through him. Ultimately, this is why Paul speaks of the Passover. He uh, speaks of this time where a lamb was taken and slain, you know this, children, and the blood was put around the doorpost so that as the angel of death came through Egypt, that he would pass over the place where God's people were because they were covered by the blood of the lamb because that lamb had died for them. And then he would take them out of Egypt and cause them to be his people set apart for himself. And Paul is saying, Christ has died for you. That lays an obligation upon you to be holy in all of your life and to live keeping the feast. The Feast of Passover was where they celebrated the salvation that had been won for them and where they, they ate the lamb, where they fellowshiped together over the lamb. And so when he says, purge out the leaven, but, but keep the feast, keep the feast in sincerity and truth, what he's saying is, Live in and for Christ in sincerity and truth. Feed on Christ throughout your life. Seek to, to purge out the sin, not just by creating a bunch of rules for yourself and trying to, to follow them meticulously, although that can be helpful, but do it by the power of Christ in you by His Holy Spirit as you commune with Him. Each and every day, walk with him, keeping the feast, and therefore purge out the leaven from your life, the sin from your life, and the sin from our congregation, and the sin from the church of God in this land. Be holy. We see in this passage a call to take sin seriously. The attitude that that requires is a mourning over sin. The tool that is pressed upon us is church discipline. And the, the purpose that all of that is working towards is holiness in Christ. And so as I close this morning, I want to exhort you to make mourning for sin a regular part of your devotional life. Take example from Joshua, from Ezra. Mourn over your own sin. Speak to God about it. Speak to God about why it is heinous. Mourn over the sin of his church. Mourn over the sin of our land. When you pray in the prayer meeting, pray about these things. Mourn over sin. I want to exhort you to pursue holiness. This passage shows us how seriously God takes sin in our lives. Even so seriously that he would allow someone to be handed over to the devil for the destruction of the flesh. 
in extreme circumstances. It's warning us not to be lax about their sin, but it is driving us to Christ, our Passover lamb, whose death gives us the cleansing that we need from sin, whose death gives us the power that we need to overcome sin in our lives, and who is risen again and who has given us his spirit that we might commune with him each and every day and live more to his glory and holiness. And so pursue holiness, looking unto Christ, And finally, support trust discipline. Have a positive attitude for it when it's rightly administered. Pray for it when it's rightly administered. And be humble under it if it is your turn to receive it. Let us take sin seriously, pursuing holiness for the glory of Christ. Let's pray. O Lord God, we pray that you would help us to hear this, that it might not just be something that goes in one ear and goes out the other, but in a time of laxity, in a time where this world is even so confused about what is right and wrong that we would be a congregation that mourns over sin, that takes sin seriously, that makes use of right church discipline and that pursues holiness. Not for our own glory. All the holiness that we ever achieve is of your grace, Lord God but that your Son might be lifted up amongst us and that we might give no cause for his name to be reviled. And we ask it in his name. Amen. Well, please take your hymnals and turn with me to hymn.